<laughs> All right. Well, our subject this evening is Israel in end time prophecy. And I don't have to uh, say much about whether or not that's a popular topic within Christendom today because it's in every Christian book. So on every uh, Christian radio station out there, they are always talking about Israel as it applies in Bible prophecy. So just a couple um, books that I've brought together here in this presentation, just some quotes out of the book. So this is a cup of trembling. The author is Dave Hunt. He says, fast moving events in the Middle East point almost daily toward the grand finale, the time of greatest suffering for the Jewish people worldwide, which will climax in the terrifying battle of Armageddon and the glorious return of Messiah to rescue Israel and reign over the world from David's reestablished throne in Jerusalem. This is another one from uh, Hal Lindsey. How many here have heard of Hal Lindsey? Uh, the late, 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 great planet Earth, I think was his most famous book. He has a whole chapter here in Planet Earth 2000, Israel, the Center of World Destiny. Edward Dodson, 50 Remarkable Events Pointing to the End. So again, chapter dedicated to Israel, God's focus for the future. Uh, Randall Ross, he's got in his book here a whole chapter, Recognition of Israel as the Forgotten Key to End Time Prophecy. And The Edge of Time by Peter and Patty Lalande. They have a whole chapter on the Third Temple. I mean, so prolific in Christendom is this idea. This, was, this poll was taken in 2018. It says here, the Lifeway poll found that 80% of evangelicals believed that the creation of Israel in 1948 was a fulfillment of biblical prophecy that would bring about Christ's return. That coupled with the fact that Israel is one of our key allies in the world today. Uh, the secular world is always focused on Israel as well. And so you may remember when Trump recognized Jerusalem as Israel's capital. That made some headlines a couple of years ago, and it was talked about um, a lot in the news. So here are a summation, really, of the six common teachings on Israel and Bible prophecy. The first thing is that they believe, as I was just mentioned, the rebirth of the state of Israel in 1948. The second, the third temple will be built on the Temple Mount in Jerusalem. Then there will be a secret rapture, then a seven-year period of great tribulation. The rise of the Antichrist will come after that, and then there'll be a final war against Israel at Armageddon. Now, if you've been paying attention uh, during the seminar, we've kind of already blown holes through many of these beliefs, right? So the secret rapture, not biblical. Seven-year period of great tribulation, even though we recognize that there will be a period of great tribulation, I would challenge anybody to show me where in the Bible it says that there's going to be a seven-year tribulation, even though it's a very accepted teaching in the Christian world today. I have yet to find that verse, other than a distortion that's found in Daniel 9, which has nothing to do with uh, end time prophecy as it as it is in uh, our understanding the rise of the antichrist we learned about the antichrist he's already here right so as you study the bible you begin to find that these popular ideas are are totally out of sync with biblical truth so the real question tonight as we study together is what is the role of israel in the last days and we're going to find that out so we're going to start in the book of Genesis, and we're going to follow the terminology of Israel straight through the Bible and see if we can make sense of uh, what can be a very confusing topic. So uh, Genesis chapter 32, as we come to the story of Jacob, the history of Jacob, uh, you may recall Jacob was the brother of who? Does anybody remember? Esau. Uh, they were twins, but not identical twins. What was unique about Esau? He was furry. <laughs> That's a term you don't hear every day, right? That's not a way we describe each other, but Esau was a very hairy individual, and uh, he was born, he, was, he would be considered the firstborn to Isaac. And so being the firstborn, he should have gotten the blessing that was promised to him. But through some influence of Jacob's mother, uh, Jacob actually went into Esau, or, um, uh, into Isaac when he was very old and tricked him into giving him the blessing. So he put some, some fur on his arms and he felt like Esau and he 
probably put some campfire gamey smell on him. He smelled like Esau, but he didn't sound like Esau, like something was up. But nevertheless, he did deceive his father, Jacob. He fled then for 20 years uh, over fear that his brother would try to kill him over that incident. And we find here in Genesis 32 that Jacob is traveling back. Jacob feels the call to make things right with his family. His father has died, and so he is now heading back to make amends with his brother. And so we read now in Genesis 32, verses 22 through 30, and he arose that night and took his two wives, his two female servants, and his 11 sons and crossed over the ford of Jabbok. He took them, sent them over the brook, and sent over what he had. Then Jacob was left alone, and a man wrestled with him until the breaking of day. Now, when he saw that he did not prevail against him, he touched the socket of his hip, and the socket of Jacob's hip, hip was out of joint as he wrestled with him. And he said, let me go, for the day breaks. But he said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. So he said to him, what is your name? He said, Jacob. And he said, your name shall no longer be called Jacob, but what? Israel. First time in scripture that the name is used. And then this being that he's wrestling with says, for you have struggled with God and with men and have prevailed. Then Jacob asked, saying, tell me your name, I pray. And he said, why is it that you ask about my name? And he blessed him there. So Jacob called the name of the place Peniel, for I have seen God face to face and my life is preserved. So you can imagine that night as Jacob is wrestling that in immediately he probably thought maybe this was Esau that had come upon him and he was wrestling against his own brother. Then he may have thought this was a stranger, but it didn't take long for him to realize that this was no human being that he was wrestling with. And uh, we find in, in the book of Hosea that it says that he actually wrestled or struggled there with God. It's speaking about Jacob. It says in Hosea 12, verse 3, he took his brother by the heel in the womb and in his strength, he struggled with God. So in our text there, God is speaking to Jacob, and he says to him, what is your name? Do you think that God did not know the name of Jacob that night? Of course he knew the name of Jacob. What, what, for what purpose then is he asking Jacob to say your name? Because in Bible times, names meant something, right? They had meaning behind them. What does the name or did the name Jacob mean? mean does anybody know yeah it meant deceiver and it, it really came from his birth where he grabbed his brother's heel that was it was just mentioned there in hosea where it was like he was trying to come out first but he was not the firstborn and so they named him deceiver well through the events and his own choices he actually kind of lived up to that name right and god is there struggling jacob is already feeling guilt for this event that happened in his family he wants restitution he wants to be made one with his family again. And in God asking him, what is your name? He was asking him to confess, what are you? And Jacob says his name. And God says to him, your name shall no longer be Jacob, but Israel, for you have struggled with God and with men and have prevailed. And he said, thy name shall be called no more Jacob, but Israel. So Israel, the name that was given to Jacob, we could say is a spiritual name. Would that be a fair statement this evening? All right. And it means one who is victorious. All right. So that's what the name Israel means. Now, as we speed forward in our story, Jacob has 12 sons, Reuben, Simeon, Levi, Judah, Issachar, Zebulun, Benjamin, Dan, Naphtali, Gad, Asher, and of course, Joseph. Now we know the story of Joseph well. Uh, Joseph was a very interesting character as you study his story you'll begin to realize that, first of all, he had prophetic dreams, didn't he? Joseph had dreams that put him uh, maybe in a bad light with his brothers as he relayed these dreams, because oftentimes in the dreams, he was the one that was being bowed down to. He was the one being served by his brothers, and he was the youngest, right? So did that make him popular among his brothers? No way. I'll tell you what else didn't make him popular was that colored coat that his father made for him, right? <laughs> Which kind of distinguished Joseph as like the favorite son. That for sure did not make him popular with his brothers. And so we know the story. 
they, out of jealousy and hatred towards Joseph, sold him into slavery. Through God's providential hand, Joseph ends up almost second in command, if you will, in Egypt. And Joseph is able, during a, a plague that strikes the land, a famine that's there, he is able then to deliver his family out of harm's way. And so what, what they had meant for harm, the Bible says God had meant for good, right? Now, we're speeding forward in time. Joseph's family, all of the descendants of Jacob now end up in Egypt. And how long are they in Egypt? Does anybody know? 400 years. So many generations there end up in Egypt. And they started out, you know, under the leadership of Joseph, very prominent in Egypt. But by the time Moses comes on the scene, the Egyptians have become jealous of them. They have pushed them down into, you know, basically slavery, doing manual labor, because they just felt like if we don't keep them down, they're just going to overtake Egypt, right? So Moses is brought on the scene as the deliverer then that would come to their rescue. Now this, I'm, I'm going through the story to get to this point because it's very crucial to understand the first time the name Israel is mentioned in scripture, it applied to Jacob. Now look as God speaks to Moses, what he says to Moses in Exodus 4, verse 22. Then you shall say to Pharaoh, thus says the Lord, Israel is my what? My son, and then he says my what? My firstborn, all right? So the first time it applied to Jacob, now God is actually applying the name Israel to the descendants of Jacob. Does everybody see that? The lineage of Jacob is now called Israel. He says again in verse 23, So I say to you, let my son go that he may serve me. But if you refuse to let him go, indeed, I will kill your son, your firstborn. And he's speaking to Pharaoh. And we know that that actually did happen through the plagues there in Egypt. So again, Jacob, one man equals Israel. Then as God uses it here in the book of Exodus, we find that he's applying it to the entire nation or the offspring of Jacob being Israel now. Now, some other characteristics you're going to find in the Old Testament that apply to Israel that are going to be important for our study tonight. First of all, there were 12 tribes because there were 12 sons of Jacob, right? So they are often referred to as the 12 tribes of Israel. Number two, they were called a vine that was brought out of Egypt. We find that in Psalm 80, verse 8. You have brought a vine out of Egypt. You have cast out the nations and planted it. Number three, Israel is referred to as God's servant, also the seed of Abraham. We find that in Isaiah 41 and verse 8. God says, but you, Israel, are my servant, Jacob, whom I have chosen, the descendants of Abraham, my friend. The fourth point is that Israel in the Old Testament was called God's elect. We find that in Isaiah 45 and verse 4. For Jacob, my servant's sake, and Israel, my elect, I have even called you by your name. I have named you, though you have not known me. The fifth point is that Israel is called God's son, even his firstborn. Now, we saw that used there by God at Moses, with Moses at the burning bush. We also find it in Hosea 11 in verse 1. The prophecy says, when Israel was a child, then I loved him and called my son out of Egypt. So knowing all those pieces, when you get to the New Testament, there's something that is absolutely amazing. The first time I heard this, I just couldn't believe all the parallels and how this puzzle, how this puzzle sort of fit into place. So as we look at the life of Christ, you're going to see that all the attributes of Israel actually apply to him. They are a picture, a pre-shadowing, if you will, of Christ himself. What do I mean by that? Well, soon after the birth of Christ, you may remember that Herod became spooked as he caught news that the coming Messiah had been born. And he sent his soldiers out to do what? kill all the man-child that, there that were in Jerusalem. So in order for God to protect his son, he gave prophetic dreams to who? Joseph. So Joseph had prophetic dreams in order to flee 
And where did they end up? In Egypt, right? They ended up in Egypt. Matthew 2, verse 13, Now they, when they had departed, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream, saying, Arise, take the young child and his mother, flee to Egypt, and stay there until I bring you word. For Herod will seek the young child to destroy him. Now it's interesting in Matthew, as you read on, that there is a secondary application to Hosea 11, verse 1. When he arose, he took the young child and his mother by night, departed for Egypt, and was there until the death of Herod, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the Lord through the prophet, saying, out of Egypt I have called who? My son. Do you see how the initial application was the nation of Israel? And in the New Testament, it's beginning to be applied to Christ himself. Hosea met its ultimate fulfillment in Christ. Let's get some other pieces of that puzzle. In the Old Testament, all those characteristics that we looked at that applied to the nation of Israel, we're going to find in the New Testament applied to Jesus. In the Old Testament, the Hebrew history, Jesus or Joseph had dreams, went to Egypt to save Israel. Joseph had dreams and went to Egypt to save Israel. God's son or Israel. When Moses was instructed to bring Israel out of Egypt, God said, Israel is my son, my what? Firstborn. We also find that when Jesus came out of Egypt, God said, out of Egypt, I have called my son. Would it be fair to say my firstborn there as well? Now, when the nation of Israel left Egypt, they were baptized in the Red Sea. Now, why do I say that? Because Paul actually says that in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. They went through the Red Sea, but notice Paul says here, and were all baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea. What was the first thing that Jesus did as he started his ministry? He was baptized to fulfill all righteousness. And during that baptism, Jesus was called by God the Father, my beloved son. Now, after Israel went through the Red Sea, they spent 40 years in the wilderness. After Jesus was baptized, he spent how long in the desert? 40 days. And what do we learn about Bible prophecy? In Bible prophecy, a day equals a year. So Jesus spent a day for every year that the nation of Israel spent in the wilderness. So Jesus is going over the same history, if you will, as Israel went through, but this time where Israel failed, Jesus is the overcomer. Jesus resisted the devil's temptation by quoting three scriptures from the book of Deuteronomy. It's interesting to note that that is the same book that God gave to, to uh, Israel at the end of the 40 years in the wilderness through the, through the writings there of Moses. So like we said, Israel is a spiritual name. Who ultimately is the one who is victorious if it's not Christ. He is ultimately the, the victorious one. Is that a fair statement this evening? He didn't just overcome a sin. He overcame all sin. So what is the meaning in these parallels? Jesus did what Israel did not. Did they, were they victorious, by the way, in the desert for those 40 years? Or did they fall over and over and over again to temptation? We come to the life of Christ, and he goes to the depths of what humanity can be pushed to, and he is victorious over the devil's temptation. So Jesus did what Israel did not. He became the new or spiritual Israel, we could say, the Prince of God. Let's get some other pieces. Matthew 12, 16 through 20, it says, And charged them that they should not make him known, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, saying, Behold, my servant, whom I've chosen, my beloved, in whom my soul is well pleased, I will put my spirit upon him, and he shall show judgment to the Gentiles. This now is being applied to Christ when it originally it was applied to the nation of Israel, taken from Isaiah 42, 1 through 3. Behold, my servant, whom I uphold, my elect one, in whom my soul delights, I have put my spirit upon him, he will bring forth justice to the Gentiles. So Christ fulfills Isaiah's prophecies. Matthew is quoting Isaiah 42, 1 through 3. Original context was speaking of God's servant, which was Israel, 
And he says, you are my servant in Isaiah 41, now applied to Christ himself. What about the vine? In the Old Testament, Israel was referred to as the vine that came out of Egypt. What did, John, what did Jesus say in John 15? I am the true vine, right? And my father is the husbandman. God referred to Israel as my son, even my firstborn. In Colossians chapter 1 and verse 15, speaking of Christ, says, who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. Jacob, when he originally fled from his family, you might remember he took a nap there, and what did he use as a pillow? A rock, right? It says in Genesis 28, 12, then he dreamed, and behold, a ladder was set up on the earth, and its top reached to heaven, and there the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. We call this Jacob's ladder right? So he has a dream with this ladder. Angels are going up and down on the ladder. In John chapter 1, as Jesus is speaking with Nathanael, Nathanael came to Jesus and said, Rabbi, you are the son of God. You are the king of Israel. And Jesus said to him, most assuredly, I say to you, hereafter you shall see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending upon who? The son of man. Everything about Jacob's life, about the, the nation of Israel, almost gets duplicated in the New Testament as it applies to Jesus himself. Let me give you another example. Jacob dug a well, and there was water in that well, right? <laughs> what, for what reason do you dig a well but for water? Well, in the New Testament, we find Jesus coming to that very well. The story is in John chapter 4 and verse 12. The story is known as the woman at the well. She says to Jesus, are you greater than our father Jacob, who gave us the well and drank from it himself, as well as his sons and his livestock? Jesus answered and said to her, whoever drinks of this water will thirst again. Jesus is basically saying it's just water, right? There's nothing special about the water coming out of Jacob's well. But then he goes on to say, but whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him will never thirst. Does that sound like different water to you? Yeah. But the water that I shall give him will become in him a fountain of water springing up into everlasting life. The prophet Isaiah called Israel the seed of Abraham. We find in Galatians chapter 3 and verse 16, now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He does not say, and to seeds, plural, as of many, but as of one, and to your seed. And then he says very specifically, who is Christ? So, Sam, if you're saying that Jesus is the New Testament Israel, is he the only one then that's known as Israel in the New Testament? And the answer is no. Just like in the Old Testament where the name Israel first applied to Jacob, one man, it then applied to the entire offspring of Jacob, right? They became the nation of Israel. In the same way, in the New Testament, Jesus is the ultimate Israel. But for those who are the children, if you will, of Jesus, the sons and daughters of God, those become spiritual Israel as well. Galatians chapter 3, verse 29. And if you are Christ, speaking of you and I, then you are what? Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Just like God made a covenant with the 12 tribes of Israel, you read in Exodus 24 that Moses actually sprinkled blood upon them as he was making that covenant. So this is the blood of the covenant which the Lord has made with you according to all these words. The same thing Jesus plays out in the New Testament. Jesus made a new covenant with 12 apostles in the upper room. Matthew 26, 28, for this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for, the, for many for the remission of sins. Does the New Testament talk about the nation of Israel? It does. But you have to be a Bible student as you're reading through the New Testament. There are, there are two types of Israel in the New Testament. There are those of the flesh who looked at the lineage 
and, and really like the fleshly part of what Israel was based on descendants and father's father. And then there is the Israel of the spirit, which are all the children of God who are grafted in, if you will, to the spiritual Israel concept. Let me give you a couple examples. Romans 9, verse 6, Paul says, for they are not all Israel, which are of Israel. Do you see the distinction there? They're not all Israel, which are of Israel. In other words, there is an Israel of the flesh, and there is an Israel of the spirit. Galatians 3, Paul says it this way, even as Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness, know you therefore that they which are of what? Faith, the same are the children of Abraham. You see how it's a faith lineage and not, you know, a literal lineage? In Matthew 3, as we're looking at John the Baptist's ministry, it says, In those days came John the Baptist preaching in the wilderness of Judea. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees come to his baptism, he said unto them, O generation of vipers, who hath warned you to flee from the wrath to come? And this is very important what John says here. Think not to say within yourselves, we have Abraham as our father. For I say unto you that God is able of these stones to raise up children unto Abraham. And now also the axe is laid unto the root of the trees. Therefore, every tree which bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. Did you catch what John was saying there? He's saying to the people that gather, don't think yourself special because of your lineage, because you can trace your father's father's father. That's not how God looks. Does not God look upon the heart and not on the outward appearance? In John, when Jesus first meets Nathanael, Jesus says some interesting words. He says, Jesus saw Nathanael coming to him and saith of him, behold, an Israelite indeed in whom is no guile. Now, if someone can be an Israel indeed, or a, yeah, a Israelite indeed, doesn't that also imply that they could not be an Israelite indeed? So there would be a true Israelite and there would be a false Israelite. So God is not judging us by what family we are born into. And that's a common theme in the New Testament, by the way. Read here in Acts 10, as Peter began to realize that the gospel was to go to the entire world. Peter opened his mouth and said, in truth, I perceive that God shows no partiality, but in every nation, whoever fears him and works righteousness is accepted by him. In Acts 15, as the Holy Spirit fell on Gentiles, it says here, so God who knows the heart acknowledged them by giving them the Holy Spirit just as he did to us and made how much of a distinction? No distinction between us and them, purifying their hearts by faith. Paul says in Romans 2, For he is not a Jew who is one outwardly, nor is circumcision that which is an outward in the flesh, but he is a Jew who is one inwardly, and the circumcision is that of the heart. And the spirit, not in the letter, whose praise is not from men, but from God. You know, when you really consider this topic and people tend to put the nation of Israel in this category that God is going to save them, or he looks favorably upon them because they are Israel. What does that say about God? What kind of distortion are we talking about here where he is going to show favor to somebody because of their father's 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 father, regardless of whether or not they accept him. Did the nation of Israel accept Jesus as an entire nation? No, they rejected him. So why is it that we, we try to paint God into this individual who will somehow show favoritism towards somebody based on an earthly lineage? That, that does not match up with the character of the God I serve. So is the New Testament church the same then as spiritual Israel? It is. I mean, even though it was founded upon literal Jews, they were also spiritual Jews, spiritual Israel. And as we come into the faith, as we accept Christ, we are grafted into that spiritual Israel. In John 10, Jesus said, that, said it this way, And other sheep I have which are not of this fold. Them also I must bring, and they will hear my voice, and there will be how many flocks? One flock 
and one shepherd. Now you might be sitting there saying, well, this is kind of strange. I thought the nation of Israel had a lot to do with prophecy. You know, the nation of Israel as a nation, prophetically, was actually cut off. Now we're going to spend a whole night on this, so I don't want to let too much of this out of the bag. But in Daniel 9, there's a specific prophecy that is actually attached to when Israel, the nation of Israel, would, would be cut off from God. And I don't mean cut off in the sense that they couldn't find salvation. What I mean is cut off as far as ever being his representatives ever again. And you find in Daniel 9, it says 70 weeks are determined upon thy people. You know, the prophecy is speaking to Daniel. Who would Daniel's people have been? It would have been the Jewish nation, right? 70 weeks are determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city to seal up the vision and prophecy. Now, the Hebrew word there, determined, literally means cut off or separated from. So 70 weeks of this prophecy that's being talked about here are specifically for the Jewish people. And when that 70 weeks would run out, they would no longer be God's representatives. Now, in Bible prophecy, we know that a day is equal to what? A year. So 70 weeks is 70 times seven or 490 days. Prophetically, that would be 490 years. All right. Now, what's interesting is you get to the New Testament without letting the dates of this prophecy out, because it's a very good study. When you look at Matthew 18, Peter comes to Jesus with a very interesting question. He says, Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? And then Peter, thinking himself to have given a good answer, says, up to seven times? What does Jesus say? Seventy times. No, Jesus said to him, I, did not, I do not say to you up to seven times, but up to seventy times seven. That is clearly referencing the prophecy in the book of Daniel, 490, 70 times 7, or 70 weeks. That's how long God would wax long with Israel as a nation, forgive them, give them chances, try to call them back. But eventually he says, no, I'm going to take what is yours, and I'm going to give it to another nation, a spiritual nation. You know, in the New Testament, just like the Old Testament, the imagery of the tree being likened unto to Israel is brought out many times, the fig tree. You saw it there in the writings of John in verse 10 there, not the writings of John, but the uh, John the Baptist, verse 10, it says, and now also the ax is laid unto the root of the trees. Therefore, every tree which bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down. It's not referencing real trees here. This is a spiritual application to God's people. If that nation is not bearing fruit, God is saying through the prophet John here that that tree will be hewn down. Hosea 9 verse 10, I found Israel like grapes in the wilderness. I saw your fathers as the first fruits on the fig tree in its first season, but they went to Baal Peor and separated themselves to that shame, they became an abomination like the thing they loved. God tried for 70 weeks or 490 years to woo Israel back to his allegiance, but they would not. And so at the time of Christ, you find some very interesting statements here about the fig tree that actually apply to the nation of Israel. We read here in Luke 13, he also spoke this parable. A certain man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard, and he came seeking fruit on it and found how much? None. Then he said to the keeper of his vineyard, look, for three years I have come seeking fruit on this fig tree, and I find none. Cut it down. Why does it use up the ground? But he answered and said to him, sir, let it alone this year also until I dig around it and fertilize it. And if it bears fruit, well, but if not, after that, you can cut it down. This prophecy or parable, parab parabolic prophecy, if you will, was given right after the ministry of John and after uh, a half year into Jesus' ministry or two and a half or two let me just read it. <laughs> Look, for three years, and in, in the parentheses there, John preached a half year, and Jesus at this point in the story preached two and a half years. I have come seeking fruit on this fig tree and find none. Cut it down. Why does it use up the ground?
But he answered and said to him, Sir, let it alone this year also, the last year of Christ's ministry, until I dig around it and fertilize it. And if it bears fruit, well, but if not, after the last year of Christ's ministry, we, we know based on Daniel how much longer after, but that tree would be cut down. The nation of Israel would no longer be God's representative. It's probably said more clearly here in Matthew 21. And again, this is an acted parable. It says, now in the morning, as he being Christ returned to the city, he was hungry and seeing a fig tree by the road, he came to it and found nothing on it, but what? But leaves. This tree was giving the, the semblance that it had fruit. It was showing leaves. You know, you can tell by, by the trees when the leaves are certain foliage or a certain color, you can tell when there should be fruit there. This tree gave the leaves, but there was no fruit. So it says he came to it and found nothing on it, but leaves and said to it, let no fruit grow on you. How often? Ever again, immediately the fig tree withered away. Now on the next day, when they had come out from Bethany, he was hungry. And this is a parallel gospel here. And seeing from afar, a fig tree having leaves, he went to see if perhaps he would find something on it. When he came to it, he found nothing but leaves, for it was not the season for figs. In response, Jesus said to it, let no one eat fruit from you ever again. And his disciples heard it. Was Jesus angry with the tree? What do you think? Was he angry with that fig tree? Or was this an acted parable where he was saying that fig tree represents this nation? They have not given the fruits of righteousness. They will be cut off from being my representatives and not just for a while, right? You know, because modern day prophecy teaches that they would come back and in 1948, oh, amazing prophecies are fulfilled and now they're a nation again and, and, you know, they're back in God's favor and all this goofiness. What did Jesus say? When would they be eaten of again? Never, never again would the nation of Israel, the literal nation of Israel be looked at as God's representatives on earth. You know, you speed forward in time, by the way, and in AD 70, it, the nation of Israel, Jerusalem there, was destroyed. And they were first surrounded by Cestius in AD 66, and then he retreated for a short spell when Jesus' words echoed through that city that they were to leave, not look back, right? Don't go in the house to get your things just get out. There was that short time period where all the Christians who remembered the words of Christ got out of that city. And when Titus came back in AD 70, they surrounded that city and they starved those people out on the inside to the point where they were eating their own children. They were gnawing on the, the straps of their sandals for any kind of nutrition. They were trying to escape by night and were told by historians at that time that there were so many crosses out around the edge of that city that you could scarcely walk in between them. That's how many people they crucified trying to escape from Jerusalem. Yeah, they were destroyed. That city was leveled. All that Jesus had said came true. Matthew 21, verse 43, Jesus said very specifically, the kingdom of God shall be taken from you and given to a nation bringing forth the fruits thereof. What was that other nation? It was a spiritual nation. It was made up of people like you and I, people that could be of Jewish background, Gentile background, all different kinds of backgrounds. What is the commonality? They were reborn into the family of God, born again into the spiritual Israel. So again, I want to make the point, can we look at the nation of Israel as God's people today? Should we be making statements like that? What did Jesus say? He who is not with me is against me. And he does not gather with me scatters abroad. Now, I'm not saying that to be anti-Semitic. I'm just saying that I think it's, it's counter to Scripture to refer to the nation of Israel as God's people today. It's, it's not true. They rejected Christ as a nation. Doesn't mean that they couldn't accept him as individuals and, and we treat, would treat them as any other missionary field. Amen? But as far as looking at them as some kind of nation that's looked upon as in God's favor, that is not scriptural. They rejected him as Messiah, and they are not uh, his people any longer. 
Now, some would say, won't all Israel be saved? How many have heard this before in Bible prophecy? All Israel will be saved. Okay, nobody. I'm going to skip that part. Well, where they get it from is Romans 11. It says, and so all Israel will be saved. And of course, at that point, you close the Bible and you say more things about Israel that aren't true. But what, what Israel is Paul talking about here? Spiritual Israel. All Israel will be saved as it is written. The deliverer will come out of Zion and he will turn away ungodliness from Jacob. For this is my covenant with them when I take away their sins. How many here are under the new covenant? Just show of hands. New covenant Christians, amen. You want to read the new covenant? It's found in Hebrews 8 and verse 10. You know who the, who, the new covenant, it's hard to say. The new covenant is made for? It's made for Israel. Let's read it. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of who? Israel, after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws in their mind and write them on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. So in order to be a new covenant Christian, we must understand that we are a spiritual Israel. That's the only way that we could fall under the new covenant, because that's who God is making the covenant with, is spiritual Israel. Should Christians focus on earthly Jerusalem? What do you think? No. No. They're no longer considered God's representative people. They never accepted Christ. All promises in scripture that used to apply to Israel now apply to spiritual Israel. You know the two most important words in God's covenants that or promises that he makes? If and then. If and then. When God makes a promise, he says it like this. If you do this, then I will do that, right? When the nation of Israel was unfaithful to him, would God still be faithful to his promise if he said, if and then? No. If they didn't do this, then guess what? He's not going to do that, right? But he will fulfill his promise through who? Spiritual Israel. All those promises that originally applied to the nation will be fulfilled through God's people. And so the devil would love us to focus on a war-torn, ravaged city on earth as God's city, when the reality is it's not God's city, right? Turn with me in your Bibles to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. 2 Thessalonians, we've covered this before, but I just want to make, make this point. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Because there's a lot of talk in the Christian world today about the third temple. You're going to build the third temple, then the Antichrist will come on the scene. This is where they get it from, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, beginning in verse 1. The Bible reads, Now, brethren, concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to him, we ask you not to be soon shaken in mind or troubled, either by spirit or by word or by letter, as if from us, as though the day of Christ had come. Let no one deceive you by any means, for that day will not come unless the falling away comes first and the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. And so a surface read of this text and people say, well, this, this person, whoever this is, is going to sit in the temple of God. Well, the temple of God was destroyed in 70 AD. So therefore they're going to rebuild the temple. There's going to be a third temple and the man of sin will sit in that temple. The problem with that is that in Paul's writing, the word for temple, the word naos is only ever used in two contexts. Number one, he says, do you not know that your body is the temple of God? And the second context is that the New Testament church is the temple of Christ. It's the temple of God. Now, as we studied the Antichrist, is there not a man who sits in the church, who sits in a human body, who says that he's God and claims to be God, right? 
that's the fulfillment of what, what Paul is talking about here. But the idea that they're going to rebuild the temple and that the nation of Israel plays out in Bible prophecy, it's just not there, friends. This is a distortion of what Paul was saying here in 2 Thessalonians 2. And you will be mindful to, to see as well that a distortion of Bible prophecy always points the Antichrist to the future. He's never here now. It's never something we have to worry about right now. It's the future. And of course, we're going to all be secretly raptured, so we don't have to worry about that. And, you know, every one of those distorted doctrines pulls you away from realizing what the truth is right now and that it's being fulfilled right now. In, in prophecy, as we look at, at the nation or Jerusalem in prophecy, eyes are always up, right? Every time God refers to this Jerusalem in the book of Revelation, it's the heavenly city the new Jerusalem that comes down from heaven. That's where our eyes should be. In Hebrews, Paul says it this way. These, he's speaking about all the, the martyrs of, of the past. These all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off, were assured of them, embraced them, but now they desire a better, that is a heavenly country. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. That's in the faith chapter. Which city did God prepare for them? Earthly Jerusalem? Is that, is that the city that he prepared for them? No. It's the same city, by the way, that he's preparing for you, right? Didn't Jesus say, and I go to prepare a place for you, and I will come again and receive you to myself? Which city is he talking about? It's New Jerusalem. It's a spiritual Israel and those who are God's children will, ins will inherit a spiritual Jerusalem. Now, some people who are Bible students, they read in the book of Revelation about the 144,000. And they say, ah, 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 they come from only the tribes of Israel, right? You read in Revelation 7, and I heard the number of those who were sealed, 144,000 of all the tribes of the children of Israel were sealed. And so the tribes of Israel in the book of Revelation, if we understand them to be spiritual Israel, makes a whole lot more sense than literal tribes of Israel. Now, why do I say that? Well, first of all, the 12 tribes of Israel, as they're listed in Revelation 7, is unique to any other listing in Scripture. Numbers 1 there shows the typical listing of the 12 tribes. You'll notice that Ephraim and Dan are listed there, whereas they're not listed in Revelation 7. Now, if you take the spiritual application of the 12 tribes of Israel on the right-hand side, and by the way, we don't even know, you can't even trace lineage-wise who the tribes are anymore. After the dispersion, after they were ousted by Assyria and Babylon, and then the rebuilding, many of these tribes since the time of Christ and forward after those rebuildings are totally lost. You, you can't even, you, you can't know for sure who's of what tribe. So to try to take it literal, again, is twisting the scripture. But if it's a spiritual application and we are grafted in, then there's a deeper message to the 12 tribes than, than appears on the surface. What could that message be? Well, may I submit to you this evening that each one of those tribes is listed in a specific order because it makes a specific paragraph. Rachel and Leah, as they had these children, they gave prophetic names to each one of the children. Judah, when he was born, his name means I will praise the Lord. Reuben, he has looked on me. Gad, he has granted good fortune. Asher, happy am I. Naphtali, my wrestling. Manasseh, making me to forget. Simeon, God hears me. Levi, he is joined to me. Issachar, he purchased me. Zebulun, a dwelling. Joseph, God will add to me. Benjamin, the son of his right hand. If you take those names and you join them together, in the order they're written in Revelation, these names describe the story of the church's struggle, redemption, victory, and marriage to the Lamb. So here's the paragraph. I will praise the Lord, for he has looked on me and granted good fortune. Happy am I for my wrestling God. Does that sound like Jacob of old? My wrestling God is making me to forget. God hears me 
and is joined to me, he has purchased me a dwelling place. God will add to me the son of his right hand. Isn't that beautiful? So what urgent message does God have for spiritual Israel as we understand it in Scripture? Well, you begin to make these applications. The, the New Testament actually will begin to pop, come alive, um, you know, just like uh, the concept of Babylon. You know, Babylon was a literal city that fell in the Old Testament. Well, in the book of Revelation, it talks about Babylon falls and fall, is fallen is fallen. It talks about that spiritual application. So just as God called literal Israel to come out of literal Babylon in Old Testament times, even so is Jesus now calling the Israel of God to come out of spiritual Babylon before it's too late. Our Lord declares, come out of her, my people, that you be not partakers of her sins and that you receive not of her plagues. So as we begin to close this evening, when Jacob wrestled with God, God asked Jacob, what is your name? And Jacob admitted, probably despairingly, that his name was Jacob. You know, maybe you feel like that this evening. Maybe there's some things in your past. Maybe there's some things you're not proud of, things that you're ashamed of, things that you want to give to God, you want to make restitution for. And that's the beauty of coming to Christ, isn't it? is that born-again experience where you can start new in a new family, right? Spiritual Israel. And we get new names. Let's go in Revelation 3 as we close. Revelation chapter 3. Just as Jacob received a new name, as we come to Christ, we're promised that we're going to get new names too. Revelation 3, we'll look at verses 11 and 12. Revelation 3 and verses 11 and 12. This ties in with Kevin's Bible answer time there in the beginning. Beginning in verse 11, the Bible reads, Behold, I am come, coming quickly. Hold fast what you have that no one may take your crown. He who overcomes, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God. And he shall go out no more. I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down out of heaven from my God. And I will write on him my new name. How many here would like to have a new name this evening? Amen. Well, would you stand with me together as we close in prayer? Father in heaven, Lord, as we have considered just briefly this evening the concept of your spiritual Israel, that you, through your son, ultimately were the one true overcomer, the true prince who overcomes, and that by faith we can come into your family, that we also can be the children of Israel, and that your New Testament church is that spiritual Israel. Father, we pray that you would help us not only to understand this each individually, but that you would help us to spread this good news to others, that they may see the truth about your character, that you don't judge us based on lineage, but you judge us based on faith. We ask that you would help us to do that in Jesus' name. Amen.